Welcome back to the show, everyone. In this episode, I'm here with Brian Scheidester. He's the Industry Vice President for Global Public Sector at Genesis and an advisor to the G20 Global Smart City Alliance at the World Economic Forum. Brian is also the host of the Government Huddle podcast and is a member of the Forbes Technology Council. I've invited Brian onto the show specifically today to discuss smart cities of the future. And as we look at this, uh, Brian discusses the framework that's needed to build a smart city of the future. And there are innovative modern technologies that like IoT and AI that are gonna help transform our cities and make our everyday lives, or at least the intent is to make them easier and for governments to be able to serve us citizens better. And governments around the world are looking to infuse aspects of their operations from traffic, from congestion, to public transportation, to power supplies, uh, to sanitation, urban mobility, like uh, like driverless cars, and then in general infrastructure. But to, but to move to where we are, from where we are today to a dynamic technology, IoT, AI-driven city, we must build the right foundation of policies and public-private partnerships to drive the transformation in the right direction. And we must ensure that we have the right protections, the right governance frameworks, the right safety, the right right privacy, the the right accountability, so that we have the trust of the the citizens citizens of of, of all of our cities. So I've never done this uh, and had this type of discussion before, but I'm very excited for, for you all to listen to my conversation with smart city expert, Brian Chidester. Enjoy. So Brian, I wanna welcome you to the show today. Really, really happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. So I was doing a little bit of uh, looking into your background and and, and I see that you uh, uh, played soccer in uh, division one soccer in uh, college. And, I did, I did. Uh, where'd you play high school? So I went to Lake Braddock High School in okay. uh, in Burke, Virginia, just outside of Washington D.C. I, as we'll kind of talk about, I grew up in the Washington D.C. area my entire life for the most part. So, um, kind of been around government and politics, which kind of brought me in. But no, played I played soccer since the age of five, and um, all the way through college and a little bit beyond. Now, did you did you go through the academy system, or did you work mostly through the club system uh, here? I'm a little older, Bill. So the, uh, the academy system really wasn't, uh, wasn't developed yet. I, uh, it's actually a funny story. I, I attended a camp when I was in ninth grade. And, um, so I was a goalkeeper and I went to a goalkeeper camp, uh, a person by the name of Alan Kelly, who, um, if there's any soccer fans out there, they might recognize the name. He's a hall of fame goalkeeper for the Irish national team. Um, much, much older, uh, he used to joke around back when they didn't wear gloves, um, but he was the goalkeeper coach for DC United. And he actually brought me in to train with the first team for a few years um, while I was in high school, which was a, a really, really cool experience. I think was something that kind of laid the groundwork for my one, my ability to to play in, in college and beyond, but two, um, kind of defining even further the type of work ethic it takes to be at that level of anything soccer or sport or anything you're doing. Oh, so he pulled you into the first team. Uh, so the uh, DC United team as you're in high school, he had you training with some of the, well, that's a big, that's a big opportunity there. Yeah. Like I said, they didn't have the Academy team yeah. at the time. It, it was something that, that was developed even after I was in college. So um, yeah, it was a great experience. Oh, that's, that's really neat. So, and then you went on to, to, to play at, uh, is it Liberty? Liberty University. Yeah. I actually went to, uh, I went to Virginia military Institute my freshman year, um, on a, on a full scholarship and, uh, and spent my whole rat year there and, uh, and ended up transferring to Liberty at the end of my rat year, which everybody jokes around and say, if you, if you made it there, how come you decided to transfer? But, um, but no, great, great experience at VMI and, and same at Liberty. I loved it. Made a lot of, a lot of lifelong friends there. And then, uh, I, and did you play afterwards? Did you, uh, I did. I, I played for a year with the, the Richmond kickers, um, in the USL, which is kind of a, if you, if you yeah. know baseball and that kind of thing, it's kind of like a triple a, um, of, uh, of the MLS. So, uh, one step down, but, um, kind of gave it up. I, I found a passion for, for marketing and business while I was in college. And, um, 
and really was eager to, to kick start my career and, and get going. And um, that's, that's how I got to where I am today. Yeah. That's, I mean, the USL league is actually a pretty big league now. Um, when, and you, when yeah, you it's at, gotten a lot bigger. I mean, I want to say there were maybe eight to 10 teams at the time when I played and now it's, it's, there's eight to 10 teams in each conference and it's scattered across the country. So it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely metastasized. No, oh, that's great. That's great. And uh, so when, how did you, how did you make the transition from to, uh, we were going to talk about smart cities today. How did you move from kind of the marketing side uh, to this? Was it a passion project or how did, how did you get into the G20 uh, advisory role, the G20 summit advisory role? Sure. So uh, you're talking about um, with the World Economic Forum, the G20 Global Smart City Alliance. So, I mean, one of the big passions of mine is honestly understanding a market um, to, a, to a really deep degree. As I mentioned, I, I started my career in marketing. And in that capacity, I think you get a lot of people that are more reactive, right? There's always that sales marketing dynamic where um, oftentimes marketers think they're beholden to sales. Sales thinks kind of marketing should be working for them. And um, and marketing gets in more of a reactionary role. And I think it, it was my feeling that you need to be more proactive and to be more uh, efficient in, in what your role is and to be a true advisor to kind of sales leadership, you need to have a really deep understanding of the market. It can't just be marketing 101, marketing tactics, but you have to understand the why behind what you're doing. And as I was getting into this, obviously, I'm um, as we had discussed, so I'm in, in the, the technology space specific to the public sector. And anybody who's in, in any type of technology space starts to realize how everything's kind of interconnected. I was, I was doing an interview on my podcast the other day, actually with, um, with somebody else who's, who's also on the, the Alliance with me. And I, I was talking to him about this concept. And I said, my wife and I were sitting in our sunroom the other day, kind of taking a look and, and thinking about all the projects that we did over the course of, of COVID. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing everybody listening, I'm sure they've done some type of, some type of project and, and it might've evolved. And anybody who's, who's done household projects knows you do one and then you realize, you know what, that's kind of flowed into the next one. And that kind of flows into the next one or the next one. And that's kind of the same way technology is. So you get into, you get into to data, right? Or, or data and analytics, you realize that kind of flows into automation. And when you get into automation, that can kind of take you in, into other foundational pieces like cloud and obviously security underpins it. And um, when you're looking at the government space, it kind of pulls you into um, something around experience. And then experience can be a digital experience through your mobile device or tablet or computer, um, but it also evolves into smart cities. So I got into kind of doing more research into smart cities and how we fit. And um, when I was at OpenText, we had a we had a, an IoT platform that um, underpinned a lot of the the smart city technology happening globally. It's also it was also the and it is the platform on which uh, GM built uh, OnStar. So if you're a GM customer and you you leverage OnStar, that was built on that OpenText platform. But um, it was it was the impetus for me to get smarter on it. And the more I dug, the more I, I saw the um, interconnections between that and kind of holistic uh, citizen experience. Um, and it really kind of took off from there. So okay. it's it, it, there's so much there. To, and I know we're going to talk about it and unpack. There's so much there around technology and policy and, and data. And it's just a really exciting space. So what? let's define a smart city for a moment. I think it would be good because... Uh, Obviously, you're coming in it from a deep, deep expert perspective. I'm just, what, what would be, what is a smart city in your, in your definition? Sure. I mean, when you think of a smart city, I really think of it as kind of a framework. Um, you don't just point to a city and say that's a smart city. It's really a framework. It's an idea, um, and it's uh, it's predominantly composed of just um, uh, ICT technology. If you guys are familiar, information communication uh, technologies and really the whole idea of this to build strategies to develop and deploy and promote uh, sustainable practices to help address some of the um, growing and advancing urbanization challenges that cities face. Um, I think one of the, one of the big underlying technologies 
because we think about IOT, right? And, and that's a big piece of that. But when you, when you really unpack it, one of the, the big foundational pieces, and I touched on it before, is cloud. I mean, these are cloud-based IoT applications um, and sensors that can receive and analyze data, manage the data in, in real time to really help improve the quality of life of, of citizens within a city or, or connected community and, and allow the, the stewards within that community to make better decisions on behalf of the, uh, the constituents. I think one of the things when people think of smart cities and we can, we can talk about the, um, the, the outcomes and, and the technologies and things like that, but really the, the most important piece of this is really the data that comes from it. It's, it's exciting because I mean, government's already some of the largest creators, consumers, disseminators, uh, and managers of data, um, in the world. And, and now the IOT ability to, to ingest this data and all the different sensors and, and endpoints that are out there is only going to advance that dramatically. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting time, but it's also the idea that with this data, um, comes a lot of insights that you can become more prescript, prescriptive on behalf of your citizens. That's why it, it really is so exciting. So uh, is there a particular country that, or a particular city in, I was looking at a statistic, there's, a, there's very f- few right now out of the total number of cities in the world that, that would be classified as smart city, but is there, are, there, are there some that are way out in front of others? Sure. I mean, it, I mean, I think when when people think of smart cities, one of the first ones that probably pops up in their head is is London. They did a lot of work um, around the the 2012 Olympics uh, when they were hosting um, to readvance what the experience was going to be like for uh, the the tourists that came in and, and the cities within the the country, and also make it more secure. Um, so so London really kind of led a big charge there. The it, I think if you take a look at the G20 um, Global Smart City Alliance, you'll see there's 26 different cities that are a part of it. Uh, and the two within uh, within the United States, uh, one one might not surprise you, uh, San Jose, um, which is which is also leading the way uh, w- with a lot of really strong initiatives and, and technologies they're deploying. Um, and it's right at the heart of Silicon Valley. The other one might, might actually surprise you, though. It's the city of Chattanooga. Um, Brent Messer, the, the CIO uh, for the city of Chattanooga, has done a really good job of kind of wrapping his arms around what this framework can really be for that city. Um, and I think this is a really good example of how it, it doesn't have to be a large, massive city like a London or, or a New York um, to, to be part of this and also to deploy technology. You actually see some of the some of the greatest innovation um, within some of these smaller cities. And um, it, it seems a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because with these, with these bigger cities comes bigger budget, but at the same time, policy roadblocks are also in inhibited. The larger the city, the more kind of bureaucracy and the more process you have to go through to, to get some of these programs approved in advance. And some of that, some of those things can be a little bit more streamlined in the smaller areas. So you see pockets of innovation within some of the smaller cities um, within the United States too. Columbus, Columbus, Ohio is another really good example. Um, so uh, I, I would say those are some ones to point to. So what, what, what would be an example of like trash removal? If if trash removal uh, were part of uh, the framework <laughs> that a CIO just tackled for. Uh, Atlanta, like what would be some of the elements that, that you've seen? And, and if you, if trash removal isn't a good example, uh, you know, you feel free to suggest, suggest one. So I, it's not exactly the, 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 tr- the process of trash removal, right? They're, they're not going to, they're not going to add technology into that process to, to get your trash out faster, but they might be able to understand where, where the process slows down. So it's really within process efficiency. Another thing that they've done is, and this is, this is actually a really, uh, to me, a, a really cool concept. Um, I was having this conversation with the chief service officer for the city of Buffalo, New York. And if, if you're familiar with Buffalo, New York, you know they experience a lot of snow, uh, lake, lake effect snow. And, and if you understand snow, you know that can, that can lead to potholes 
everywhere. So what they've done is they've turned the trash removal trucks into moving sensors. And they have added kind of video cameras, leveraging AI to be able to drive around, spot a pothole. Um, it, so when they see it, they can start kick off a process to be able to um, get that pothole filled and rectified. Now, this actually brings in another concept that is not is not just specific to smart cities or IoT, but um, but to uh, the entire kind of digital transformation process, which is edge computing. Mm-hmm. And edge computing, if you're familiar, Bill, it's it's the ability to process data at the point. So, if a, a, an example would be a sensor, right? So, oftentimes, what happens is you ingest the data. It has to go back to its home, its parents, process that data, and then it can go back out. And the exciting part about what they've done with the city of Buffalo and leveraging the edge computing concept, in, and this also factors in 5G um, because you need to be able to process it without Wi-Fi, um, is already they, it doesn't have to wait for that sensor on the trash vehicle. It doesn't have to wait for the trash vehicle to get back home for, for this data to be processed it can be driving, spot the sensor, and immediately kick off that process by processing that data at the point. So now it, it can spot it at 6 a.m. and you could have a process where by middle of the afternoon or that evening, that pothole is, is already on a calendar to be filled and, and completed. So I think that's a good example of a uh, very quick reaction time that um, both edge computing and 5G uh, from an infrastructure perspective can really bring to what the evolution of smart cities looks like. And there are, I mean, we've, we've seen 5G out there now. They're already talking about 6G and, and kind of what that is going to be able to do. So um, I think with, with the advancement of the infrastructure um, is going to come some really exciting technology uh, advancements as well. What are the concerns about 5G that you run into most frequently? I mean, so uh, the concerns about 5G are really the, the pockets of the uh, of the broadband infrastructure, right? Um, one of the things that they've they've taken a look at, especially where smart cities can help, is is digital equity, um, which we've all kind of I, I think seen rise to the surface during the during the pandemic. Um, and one of that is access to Wi-Fi and access to broadband in some of the more rural areas. So I think one of the biggest challenges is just access to to broadband. If we take a look at, at some things that are concerns holistically about smart cities, though, is with we mentioned uh, data coming out, um, but it's the privacy around around that data. You've seen some really large projects. Um, I, I think one of the ones that even even if you're not familiar with smart cities, you might actually be familiar with this is that Google was trying to do um, a large smart city project with the city of Toronto. And they, um, they actually had to pull that back because of privacy concerns. Uh, the CTO of there, Lauren Sata, has done a really good job of kind of advancing what a connected community looks like. Um, and I'm excited to see kind of what that evolution is going to look like for them because they have a really good strategy in place. But um, privacy is certainly an inhibitor to, to some of these adoptions. Um, in, in talking to, to Justin, though, one of the things we've, we've discussed is how this can actually be this can actually be something that can garner garner trust between government and and citizen if you if you kind of promote civic participation within this process and don't just push these sensors and these technologies out towards them um, but actually let them be part of the the process that will not only drive adoption um, within the community but I think you're going to see um, a greater proliferation of smart city um, advancements globally. Yeah, I mean, I know if you are in London, you know, you're you're uh, you're tracked pretty quickly when uh, when you when you hit the when you hit the streets there, yep. just because of the proliferation, how, how many cameras they put in place, um, and I can just imagine, and that's within a, the auspices of GDPR, and you yeah, know, the Europeans are are probably in front of us by a lot when it comes to privacy. And Bill, that's a, that's a good example of how you can actually take unstructured data like that and start to build, um, build data points about, about a person, right? You can stitch together video footage and you can start to build patterns of life 
um, especially with AI. Um, and, and now when, when you take a look at quantum computing coming and the different processes that process that can happen um, within, within compute, uh, you can start to put together patterns where you can track people in, in ways that people might say that's not okay. So uh, that's, why, that's why privacy has to really be addressed when you're looking at the security of the data, right? So if, if you have this video footage of these people how are you ensuring it doesn't get into the wrong hands so this type of stuff can happen? All of that is part of the conversation as you advance. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everybody is so user-centric these days, you know, on that down to the human being, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's rights. I mean, essentially the, the whole founding of the co country is based on individual rights. So it's, it's the right to be forgotten the right not to be tracked. I mean, there's there's so much to yeah. right, ha, right not to have your data and your patterns sold on the back end, or some bankrupt city puts puts these in, but then they can sell the data on the back end. So it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's something to. Um, um, I wonder if this technology is going to go too fast though, because most of the technology. Oh, it already it already has it already has. It's going to break. Think. It's going to break policy. There's just no way legislature legislators are going to go fast enough. I mean, they couldn't even regulate the uber app from being developed yeah. and and it just boom went right in and because i can guarantee you if they had it got out of front of it the taxi cab industry would have lobbied to have it uh destroyed but it's just yeah. too fast policy is always always lagging behind technology um it's i mean that's one of the reasons why government tends to be uh late adopters of technology um so some of the more disruptive technology that's out there is the policies behind it if something as simple as and and i this was actually a really good example when when I was talking to, to Brent in Chattanooga is they wanted something as simple as a digital signature to be able to facilitate certain things uh, during the pandemic. And they actually had to change policy to do that because things had things required a wet ink signature. So they had to actually change the policy before they could adopt technology to to address digital signature within their within their citizenship. So that, that, that's just a simple example of where. Um, even even the most mainstream of technologies like digital signature can be um, can be inhibited by a, a an old policy in place. And because it, 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 for many cities, it's probably quite still a manual paper based process. Um, oh, exactly, exactly. That probably requires a lot of human beings. So there's a whole introspection, of, you know, of efficiency of, of, of the impact there as well. Now you had mentioned, I'm, I'm always really, I think a lot of listeners are, okay, what are their other examples? You know, I threw out trash and then you went down the pothole route, which is, which is really cool. Um, and, and I was thinking as you were talking, what about cameras for at the tra uh, traffic lights, like uh, people blowing through intersections and such. And yeah. I know, you know, many cities, including DC, uh, had these cameras put up many years ago, probably a decade, decade and a half ago, to try to catch people speeding, and they're trying to, you know, really increase the revenue. Uh, but I'm curious, what would a smart city look like from a traffic enforcement? Yeah, so it's 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 less about the traffic enforcement because that's really just a a spot usage, right? Okay. You, it's a it's a kind of a transactionary usage, right? Somebody runs a red light. You you take the picture. It it, it kind of processes it through, and um, it, a ticket's distributed. That's it. It's really a, when I think, and this is why I go back to why and how I defined a smart city at the beginning of around a framework to to really drive sustainable development and progress for citizens. It would be more traffic congestion, right? Okay. You you have these cameras up there that can understand what are the highest periods of time. Where um, where there is traffic congestion, when are the lighter periods? Can uh, do you need to? Is there is there some type of data? Are there data points and patterns that you see that make you need to address these things? Do we need to come in from a construction standpoint and build another lane because this is just um, th this is just inhibiting the ability for people to get around our city? So how do we change? Make changes based on the data. That's why honestly a lot of this and, and I touched on it before. A lot of this comes back to. Um, the value that data can bring to the citizen. I'll give you another example, something that people might not be hearing about, but is definitely impacting their life probably on a daily basis. If you're like me, is the concept of curb management. I mean, I, how many people out there use DoorDash, right? 
especially during the pandemic. I mean, it's probably going to hit an IPO this year because it's advanced so much. But when you think about the advancement of DoorDash, and then that's going to put more vehicles on the road now through home delivery. You have Amazon out there, home delivery, um, and, and just online shopping in general. So now you're talking about congestion. You're also talking about pollution, which flows into how can we make it more eco-friendly and sustainable for our, uh, for our community? So curb management is something that's a really big trend happening with smart cities because the, the curb real estate is, is, especially in cities, but even in the, the, um, the, the suburbs, is, is kind of in high competition because yeah. of these, these deliveries and uh, whether there's bike lanes and all and and all that type of stuff. So I think leveraging that data and understanding what what pieces of property and and what is the the pattern within pieces of property that need to be addressed, I think curb management is one that, especially due to the pandemic, is is taking off within cities as they're taking leveraging the data to take a look at how that looks. Is is uh, is it right now? Is it's just uh, curb management? Is are is basically problematic because you're having the stacking effect of too many vehicles. Correct. Kind of driving. It's, so it's it's congestion, right? I, I talked about congestion, and that's obviously one, but it's also pollution. I mean, one of the one, when we look at sustainability, one of the biggest um, things that's being looked at within smart cities is is around how to address help address climate change. How can we lo- lower the city's carbon footprint by uh, by leveraging um, smart devices? Uh, even smart workplaces, and this is that, this is a really good example of how I mentioned everything's interconnected. Um, you take a look at smart cities, but it, it definitely intersects with um, the future of work. And we take a look at um, uh, kind of work, workforce, and workplace within the, that future of work. And workplace absolutely involves um, IoT and and things of that nature because you have smart thermostats, which look to save money um, for organizations, but also lower that organization's footprint and drive sustainability forward. And that intersects back with the city's strategy around how they, um, how they bring companies and organizations into that city and, and what that footprint's going to look like. So it, it's all interconnected um, throughout, uh, throughout the, the ICT world. So why are people moving to the cities? Like, what is the trend? Uh... Why are people moving back towards the cities? Well, so smart cities has been a trend um, for a while, right? I mean, I, I mentioned London back in 2012, but it, I mean, people were talking about this long before even that. I don't know if there's a trend of people moving towards the cities. I actually think it's it's more the opposite. I think at least that's what we've seen in the DC area is the kind of movement out into the suburbs and more remote areas as, as remote work has has picked up. Um, so I, I, honestly, I, I think it's more about not just the, not just the people living within the city, but also the people that, that work and, and are, are within the city. DC is a great example. I mean, the number of tourists that flow through, through DC, um, is massive on an annual basis. Um, how, how are we helping to support, um, not only sustainability there, but also in, in kind of, um, the impact that it does to pollution, and, and the climate change um, effect, but also keeping people safe and secure. Um, there's, a, there's a program out there called ShotSpotter where you can put a, uh, a sensor within, um, within a certain area to understand if there's a gunshot that happens. So all of that it can kind of flow data in it, around security and things. You got the camera, cameras out there, um, a number of different other, other technologies to, to help security. So I think it's, it's more than just the, the the population living within the city, but it's the people that are actually engaging with this within the city too. Now, do you think that um, autonomous vehicles has a, has an, uh, a role to, to bear to play? Hundred hundred percent, and that's that's when we take a look at policy. That's one of the big topics that that we're actually addressing within the G twenty. Okay. Um, city, I, I keep bringing up city of Chattanooga because they they are recognized as one of the leaders globally. Um, within the smart city space, uh, Kevin Comstock, who actually is the director of their smart city program and works with, with Brent, um, they're taking a look at how sensors speak to vehicles. How can they prevent accidents and, and pedestrian deaths within certain crosswalks by having a sensor speak to a vehicle and stop it? 
um, a, a number of different things around that. But autonomous vehicles are absolutely part of this because, again, when we think of smart cities, it's an ecosystem. It's not just it's not just about a device here and there. Um, it's a framework. It's it's policies, but it's a complete ecosystem that plays together. So what are what are some other uh, uh, what is the top uh, for the G G twenty this year within this? What is the top uh, thing? policy that you're working on or the top element of the framework that that uh, you spend most of your time on? Well, it's it's really building the underpinning. But one of the things that's been big right now is public-private partnerships. How can government entities work with the private sector, um, the, the Googles and Apples of the world um, that have um, some of that next generation technology to understand what that is, how, where it's going, what that roadmap looks like, and how it can be enveloped properly into this ecosystem. I think the public-private partnership aspect of kind of how cities approach um, it, the advancement of being more connected uh, is, is something that's very top of mind for us right now. Is there a particular um, protocol or a particular um, uh, industry standard that, that connected devices, IoT sensors, for example, um, uh, that, that, that I, mean, I, I would imagine that if you're a CIO in a city and you've got cameras and other devices that you're bolting on buildings or around the around the city you know that could take years and so is there a specific but that has to be able to interface with a larger uh, ingestion uh, capabilities so is there a, a common industry standard that's being built so people could write to code for that so so there's not a common common industry standard around the the sensor integration um, but what there is a, is platforms that are fully interoperable to be able to kind of plug into because there's so many there's so many disparate sensors out there and you have to imagine obviously they're going to continue to advance what that looks like really where the common standards sit are around the open data standards um, there's a group called the open open government partnership that takes a look at, at um, open data and, and those standards. And um, I don't know them all off the top of my head. There's 10 key principles around it, but one of them is really making the, the, the data machine readable. Um, it's, it's making sure the data that, that comes in is easily accessible and it's, it's free to access, right? You don't have to purchase some type of application to be able to read the data. It's something that is, is out there through a free application like uh, like a PDF or something like that, that, that everybody can get access to. Um, so really the, the, the common standards, standards are around the data. What they're really taking a look at is ensuring that, um, and this is more done on, the, on the, the private sector side, is ensuring that the platforms that are being leveraged to ingest this data are, are open and, and fully inter, interoperable for these sensor ecosystems and kind of future-proof to ensure that um, they can continue because it's really up to the, the technology vendors to be able to uh, understand what sensors they need to be able to um, ingest data from. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, um, what, what questions do you, uh, what questions should I be asking you about this topic or that, um, that, I, that I haven't asked so far that you think would be uh, really useful for people to, to, uh, to know about? I think I think the only thing, perhaps, is kind of what the future of smart cities look like, looks like, and and I get this question a fair amount. And generally, my answer is one: it it starts with the data, and two: it's just a more prescriptive look at what the city is going to do on behalf of their citizens. It's not really about the the technologies and the sensors, but it's about how the cities can become smarter from the data that's ingested to be more prescriptive for their citizens. I also think we're gonna see the, the emergence of the, and I, I mentioned this before, what a digital experience looks like and what a, an IRL experience looks like and how those are gonna to come together. Um, Justin and I were having this conversation the other day about what the metaverse is going to mean for, uh, for smart cities and digital experiences for citizens. You have augmented reality and virtual reality the ability to walk around a city with your smartphone and see things that, that you can't see with the, with the naked eye. Um, so these are all things that are being taken into consideration. Um, and I think it's giving governments a lot of um, opportunity to be able to really meet this next generation of citizen um, kind of right where they are, which is to me most vitally important and provide them the, kind of the personalization at scale, which is always a challenge for even, the, even private sector entities. 
that use the word IRL, the acronym IRL, what's that? In real life. I apologize. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's, yeah. In real life. Um, something we don't get a lot of right now. <laughs> um, but, uh, but just the emergence of what digital looks like with, with the, the, the real life interactions that we have um, around the city. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, my, my daughter was, uh, we're in the suburbs, but she was uh, going to a concert in DC and I just didn't recognize, I recognized the zip code. It was sort of like, uh, it was one of these venues that was uh, not like the Verizon Center kind of a venue. It was like one of these smaller ones. And, and I recognize it as being a ghetto from like when I was in living in DC 20 years ago. Yeah. And I'm like, gosh, why, why, why do we have to go to a ghetto, uh, like a uh, place to watch a concert? And, and then I called my friend who's a police officer in DC and he's like, no, 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 that's all been revitalized. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Are you, are you so, talking? I, I'm wondering as you're talking, is this the anthem? Yes. Down yes at the they, wharf? Yeah. I, I had a feeling that's where you're going. I think, yeah, that's, uh, th that's definitely a, a great new venue down there. And you're absolutely right. That whole area has been completely revitalized. It's down yeah. by where the Washington Nationals play and the and DC United plays with Audi Field. But it would be great, you know, for me, I just, I knew a police officer so I could call and say, listen, where does she park? You know, and he's like, no, no, this has all been revitalized and she's all, it's all good to go. And, but I can also imagine that you said it's all hinging on the data. So there are access, there are, there's data on crime and there's data on, on, on these places within every city. Mm -hmm. And will the cities um, basically cough up that data so that you can go in and see, you know, when you're going into a place that you're not familiar with, that you can sit there and go, okay, you know, what's the chances, you know, what is the crime statistics of this, of this, uh, of this place I'm going to? Um, versus just having to know, you know, a police officer. So I'm curious uh, if you think that that there's going to be friction between the type of data that the cities are going to be willing to cough up um, for the different particular use cases that people are going to be interested in having. I don't think there will be. I think that that data is generally open and readily available. Um, this this actually goes back to exactly what I was saying around open government partnership. There has to be readily readily available data in open formats for you to be able to access it. So yeah. if you are, if you want to understand, right, especially if you're moving, if, if you're going to move to DC and you want to move to that area, you should be able to access crime data and understand the type of area you're moving into. Um, this is actually another good example though, of where when we take a look at a city, even the size of DC or as small as Chattanooga or Columbus, you're going to have different pockets of, of kind of needs right? In, in Northeast DC, Southeast DC, et cetera, you're going to have different needs from the people that are in that area. Just like if you're on the national mall where there's a whole lot of tourism, it's good. It, like the, what a smart city ecosystem might look like there is going to be very different than if you're up by the, the national zoo, where it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more constricted. So um, as you flow around a city, you want to be able to provide the citizens and, and the, the, the people that engage there, the stakeholders there with the types of technology and the types of services that are needed within that area. Um, and that's, that actually goes back to the need for interoperability within that platform, the, the ability to integrate with disparate sensors for a single platform for a city. So you can advance what that sensor ecosystem looks like in different areas. You're not beholden to just kind of what you've had in the past. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm having a guest on Kevin Kelly. He's a, a polymath, and he's a, he's written a lot about uh, one of his books called "What Technology Wants." And you know, it's it's almost like technology is going to have to take on almost like a consciousness because it's going to have to be like our biological bodies are aware of our when we wiggle our toes and wiggle our mm -hmm. hands. Where the, our body's aware that wiggling, you know, we, we know it's in hot water or cold water, um, even though the left arm has nothing to do necessarily with the right foot. And it's it's interesting, you know, as the sensors and the data are evolving in AI, I think was it's just going to be the huge enabler here. The city is going to be aware. It's almost going to have the consciousness uh, to be able to be aware of itself. And Correct. and and I think that that's. 100% where technology is going, whether we want it to go there or not, that, that's where technology is going. <laughs> all, the, all the more reason to, to ensure that you have people that are, are informing the policy coming from the, the folks that within the community that's building some of this. So they understand kind of what it looks like, ensures that it's ethical yep. and it's providing the types of outcomes that they want it to, what it's meant for, right?
Yep. Yeah. It's, it's almost like the, the, the policy, we can call it uh, the philosophy, the ethics, the, the decision-making around right mm-hmm. and wrong and the, in the, uh, in the boundaries around all this um, it has to be, in, it has to be thought through so that the, the technology will do what we want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Not to show up. Well, Brian, this has been great. I appreciate you for, for your time uh, is as we wrap up here, is, the, is there any a particular message or a particular thought that popped in your head while we're talking that you're like, you know what, I, I really want to make this point before we go um, that that is something that, that you're passionate about or you saw kind of a gap that you wanted to fill. No, the only thing the only thing I did want to mention is for anybody who listening who is interested in uh, digital transformation, especially in in the government space. Um, I host a podcast called The Government Huddle, uh, where I bring on leaders like some of the some of the ones I, I spoke about today, as well as industry leaders. Um, to have conversations just like this around around smart cities, um, around different policies driving other other pieces of technology like low code automation and and other things. But um, but it, I thoroughly enjoy these types of conversations. I love to kind of dive into the weeds a little bit on kind of what uh, what's driving um, ultimately citizen experience forward. And I just really appreciate you, Bill, having me on here to to talk a little bit about this today. Yeah, I think everybody's, I think people are thirsty. I know a lot of the technology leaders uh, are thirsty for purpose and a mission and, and they're, they're, some of them kind of the late careers are like, okay, what do I do next? And I think mm-hmm. it's funny, you know, I think this particular space is something people can really uh, dive deeply into. And if you have a technology uh, uh, tool set that you've developed over 20, 30, uh, 40 years, this is quite a way to help usher in this technology into um uh, into an area that really needs that expertise. So they need the, yeah. the, leader, the leadership. Wouldn't you say that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that that's really at the heart of what I was talking about before the public private partnerships. It's not just about getting technology in their hands, but it's getting the understanding of how to best use and drive adoption of the technology and, and do it in a way that's going to drive the type of outcomes they're looking for. Oh, this is great, Brian. All right. Well, listen, we've never done this on smart cities before, and it's great to have you on as an expert. And I, I appreciate you for your time today. Thanks again for the time. You're welcome. Till next time. Bye-bye.